All right, let's get it rolling. Aye. Hello. Take 4,312. It feels that way sometimes. <laughs> We've all been transported to worlds beyond our wildest imagination with books. But books are also a great vehicle to get together and exchange ideas. Welcome to Books du Jour. Come and join our authors at the table. Peter James is my next guest in Dance Man's Time, and he's going to tell us about his downtime. In the, in the jail or not? Uh, have you ever been in jail, by the way? I've been many times as a talk. I give talks in prison. Oh, you do? And I find it fascinating because oh. for the English reason, jail, right? Pretty, yeah, I've always. I haven't been in a, in a supermax American one yet, but I, I find it fascinating because you get a chance to talk to the prisoners. I, I was in a woman's prison last year, mm. and I never. You never. I, I get a talk, and there was just one woman in the audience. She's about fifty-five smarter, clearly smarter than the others, asking good questions. And I thought, I wonder what you're here for. Mm. I thought maybe killed somebody drink driving or whatever. Yeah, anyway, right. I managed to get up to her afterwards. And I never say, what are you doing here? So I said, how much longer do you have to go? And she said, I've got nine and a half more bloody years to go. And it's not fair. She said, a woman did the same as me in London, and she's only got six more years to go. I said, oh, yeah, what did you do? She said, well, I poisoned my mother-in-law, the old bag. I said, really? And she, well, the thing was, she went into hospital to die and I embezzled her bank account. The bloody woman didn't die. Came out and I realised she'd find out, so I, I had to poison her. And then I realised my husband would find out, so I poisoned him too. And it's just not fair. I've got nine and a half more years to go and a woman did exactly the same as me in London and she's only got six more years to go. And I said to the officer after that, is this for real? And she said, absolutely, sir. Her husband was three and a half months on life support. Oh, my God. And permanently brain damaged, and she's just angry at the lengths of time oh, yeah. she got. So there's a disconnect uh, between yeah. the act and, and, uh, yeah. and, the, and the emotion, yeah? And it, that, it, one of the things that fascinates me about talking to prisoners is so often how they have that total... Separation? Yeah. You know, the really dangerous ones, the ones who have no empathy. Yeah. So what did you write about that? Are you afraid to be separated from your life and your head? Something like that? <laughs> I find the criminal mind, the criminal world, fascinating. What, what happened was I... I um, I'd written a number of novels, and I and I, I just got married, and I, we got burgled. This was 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and a young detective came to the house to take fingerprints, and, and you, saw, live, you live in Brighton, right? Yeah. yeah okay. And he saw my novel. It was a, a psychological thriller, and he said, "Oh, if you ever want any research with the police, give me a call." Mm -hmm. And he was married to a detective, and, and my then wife and I, we became friendly with them, and they'd invite us to a, a barbecue, to a police social night to their home, and almost all their friends were also police officers. And I found their world fascinating, you know, traffic cops, homicide detectives. Sure. And I suddenly realized that as a writer, that nobody, nobody sees more of human life in a 30-year yeah. career than a cop. Oh, absolutely. And that's really why I started writing police oh, police. We, we could have done medical thrillers. I mean, doctors in the ER, they do. They they close to that as well, no? They see a lot, but they don't see... I mean, a cop will see everything from a, a sudden infant death. Uh -huh. in, in one day, they could go from a sudden infant death to an old couple who've been defrauded of, of all their life savings, mm -hmm. to a terrible accident, to a homicide, uh, to a domestic fight where... A, I mean, I went to one recently seven-year-old girl phones the police, mummy and daddy are killing each other. And, and we go to this house, and it's a nice middle-class house, and the father's, half his lip is hanging off, right, and he's got blood pouring out of his nose. His wife's got two black eyes and her forehead gashed open. What was it about? In his words, I wanted to barbecue the beef and the bitch put it in the oven. And they well, see the, Yeah, but that stands for something bigger, obviously, yeah. right? Okay. But so, so you, you're intrigued by that type of <laughs> scenario? Yeah, I'm, I'm, intri I, I'm fascinated as a writer by yeah. what makes people tick. And right. when I, I created my detective, Roy Grace, who is based on somebody who's become a very close friend, who is a senior detective, homicide detective. And in, we have, in we have to tell our audience this is a Roy, uh, Roy Grace series, right? Yeah, the Roy Grace series. The first in the series was called okay. Dead Simple. 
And it's uh, my publishers are reissuing it as a trade paperback in October. Okay. Nine pounds ninety nine. In the states. In the states. Yeah. yeah. So called Dead Simple, uh, and that that that's a novel that uh, people love. It. It began with a wedding night prank. This guy, uh, he's always played bad tricks on his friends, and his mates decide they're going to bury him alive for two hours in a coffin in remote woods. Mm -hmm. Then they're going to come back and dig him up. They're going to go off drinking. And they bury him alive, they put the lid on, put him in the grave, cover it up, go off in the truck, and they all get killed in an accident. Oh. And that's the end of chapter one. OK. Well, you keep on reading to see what finds, OK, what happened. Um, you, you live in the, in the UK. Uh, how different is a crime scene thriller scene over there in Europe? And I mean, the UK is not even Europe, but uh, with European counterparts and then in the States, because you go back and forth between the two. Like, you, know, you, you and Lee Child are pretty much the, the, the biggest name in the crime, right? I get, yeah. Um, I mean, your ranking too in England is yeah. really massive. Um, yeah. But I think that the big... Oh, yeah, the ranking yeah, is right, yeah. yeah. But he's Scottish, right? That's true. Yeah, okay, he doesn't right, count. We're talking yeah. about Britain. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the very big difference between traditionally English crime and traditionally American crime is that the English crime writing... Is not, and I don't... I don't fit into this mold, but the, the traditional English crime writer is very much in the mold of Agatha Christie. You know, her books will begin with a dead body yeah. in, in chapter one, often in the library of a country house, That's right. and the rest of the book is a puzzle to solve it. That's right. In American crime thrillers, the victim is still alive at the end of chapter one. It's much more... I find American thrillers much more exciting to read. Mm. You know, writers like Michael Conley, I'm an early James Patterson I loved. And that's what I try to write. I, I love that genre. I've always loved the American crime writers. Mm. I've looked to them right from when I was in my teens, Ed McBain. Sure, yeah. Uh, I, who yeah. I loved. I loved the uh, Travis McGee and the John D. McDonald books just because yeah. he was so quirky. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Wamba. I think, I think that the American tradition of thriller... And crime thriller writing is, is, to me, is infinitely more exciting than, than the British tradition. Yeah. So when you have a, a main character like Roy, for all these years, and then you are also, everyone's getting older as you write so many books, uh, how is he aging? How well, is I, he coping with that process? I've played a kind of trick with time in the book. So mm -hmm. I'm now writing the 11th Roy Grace. And when we meet him in Dead Simple in the first one, he is just coming up to his 39th birthday. Yeah. And you, you, you learn that his wife, Sandy, who he loved and adored, had vanished nine years ago on his 30th birthday. And, and he's still not found. He doesn't know what happened to her. And it's an ongoing part of the, the stories. And in the 11th book, he's just had his, four, his, his 40, 40th birthday. 4-0? So, yeah, 4-0. Okay. So the whole time span of the 11 books is about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So he's only gone from 39 to 40. Because I, what I didn't want to do was age him a year in each book. Yeah. Because then he's going to hit retirement age. But you, the writer, uh, have lived those real years, right? Yeah. Your psyche has changed. And we are fluid as people. You perceive life differently. So he must have been impacted somehow, no? Oh, it has impacted quite. Yeah. I mean, it's, I guess it's impacted. Roy is maturing in the sense that for years he, he didn't have a new new love, lo love in his life because he wondered if Sandy was going to turn up again or not. Now he's fallen in love and the 11th, he's now had a baby, gets married in Book 10, and he's moving forward with his life. And I think as a, as all, a writer... All this in one year. A year and a half, year and a half. The seeds of it were there yeah. when, when I started. I want that life. You know, 11 years becomes a year and a half. <laughs> but I've moved the book forwards culturally, yeah. Yeah. so each book... Um, you know, I reflect the events that are going on in the world in each book, so each book feels like it's written in the current year. Okay. I think authors can take a certain amount of license. How many more do you think you can write about? Uh... I, I ha I'm really loving writing them. I love, yeah. I love the research. Um, I've, I've got friends here in the NYPD. I've, I've set several scenes in some of my mm. books over here in New York, going out with the police here. I find their world fascinating. I, 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 I would hope I'm going to write at least another 11. Yeah. So how do you start? You have an idea for a story, you take an idea from the newspaper cuttings, and then you make, so send the email to the, your friend's network of friends, is how it works, to pretty much, or for it, your research? It, it very much varies. With, with, with Dead Man's Time, um, I'd always wanted to write a story about revenge. Revenge fascinates me, mm -hmm. because it's such a big driver for crime. And in, and in Dead Man's Time, this, this novel starts in Brooklyn in 1920, um, and it's a... Uh, the guy whose father is a high-up member of the uh, the uh, White Hand Gang, the Irish 
Irish Mafia in, in the 1920s, and he's given this beautiful Patek Philippe watch, pocket watch. Mm -hmm. And the story picks up uh, years, he's a, this is when he's a six-year-old kid, and the story picks up in Brighton in 2012 when he's 95 years old, he's a multimillionaire, and his sister uh, has the watch, and it's stolen from a house in a horrible burglary in which she dies. And he, all he cares about is finding who no. did that, getting that watch back, and avenging his sister's death. Um, what what's the watch represents for him? It, it's, only, it, it's only an object at the end of the day. Yeah, what, it's got to stand for something else. His, his yeah? father used, when he was a child, his father would come into his bedroom, mm. and he loved the watch because it had a man in the moon in it. Mm -hmm. And he'd ask his dad every night to tell him a story about the man in the moon. And his dad would always do that. And when the book begins, the dad is telling him the story goes to bed and then they hear, he hears noises, he hears shots. And basically his mother is, is shot dead and his father is dragged away into the night and never seen again. Um, it's a revenge killing. And his aunt, who they're all Irish American family, his aunt takes him and his sister to Dublin to really get them away from the horrors of New York in 1920. Okay. And then ultimately they end up in Brighton and he goes into the antiques trade and, and the whole thing kind of connects. Okay, connect. Well, wish you all the best of the books. My guess was uh, Peter James and Dead Man's Time. So the, the clock is right here. I don't see the moon guy, but uh, I'm sure he's somewhere in there hiding. And uh, all the best to you and uh, thank you for being on Books du Jour. It's great to be back, thank you.